Hi, I'm Chancellor Holden Thorpe, and with me is biologist and conservationist Edward O. Wilson. Dr. Wilson is on campus to deliver the keynote address at our spring commencement. Ed, welcome to Chapel Hill. Well, I'm just absolutely delighted to be it's here. It's absolutely great to have you here. Yeah, you think. and I are both interested in getting kids interested in science. We are. And uh, you talked a lot in your books about growing up in Alabama and how that influenced your decision to become a scientist and your views of the world. Tell me a little bit about all that. Well, I grew up in a beautiful environment and of which you have an abundance around uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, and I was a kid that was able to spend a lot of time outdoors from an early age on. And I just developed an interest in animals and plants, but most especially uh, insects and snakes and things like that. And at some point, I became committed to the idea that I wanted to spend the rest of my life outdoors. But then, as I went through high school, I realized that you don't get to spend your life outdoors collecting butterflies and snakes unless you can somehow make a living at it. By this time, I think I had already decided I wanted to be a scientist. And so the two things came together and I went into that end of biology. You've written 25 books, and you've won two Pulitzer Prizes, and, and you've recently written a novel. And a lot of uh, people would say science and writing don't go together as well as maybe they should, but you've, you've proven those people wrong by being a great writer. Tell me about how uh, mm. the discipline and the practice of writing has integrated into your research and your life. Well. I guess I've always been a writer. I'm a Southerner. And Southerners, I hope I'm not exaggerating or stereotyping, but Southerners are storytellers. And I've always looked on scientific discoveries as stories. Oh, I mean, they're factual. But what happens to lead up to them? What ideas are embodied when you make them? What the consequences are? Those are stories. And I've always had a great pleasure in telling the stories of science, particularly of scientific natural history, ecology, evolutionary biology, animal behavior, that end of biology that operates at the level of the organism and the, uh, and the uh, population and species. So it was relatively easy for me to cultivate whatever talents I have as a writer uh, essentially, even in scientific journals, telling what I saw as the stories of the world. When it came to writing a novel, I decided that uh, I would like to try it. Uh, I wanted to be a Southern writer, but also there was the motivation of um, bringing the message of environment and conservation to a broader audience. Because I have discovered over the years that by and large people respect nonfiction, but they read novels. <laughs> Your work on biodiversity and conservation has helped us not only understand the world, but a lot about ourselves. So how can the things that, that you've described and brought to us help us as we think about the great human challenges that we face with, with inequality and resource depletion and climate change and all these things we're struggling with. The human species is a biological species in a biological world. That is to say, we evolved over millions of years into the present human level, which is exalted and high indeed, but nevertheless is all built on a very, very animal biological mm -hmm. body. Uh, and uh, we live in a, what you could see, if you, you would see, in fact, you would barely see it if you looked at it crosswise from an orbiting shuttle, a biosphere. It's a thin, thin uh, layer of living organisms plastered onto the surface of the world. And we live in that little narrow space 
as biological organisms and we depend on everything that is given to us in the way of the amount of air, the temperature, the water, the creatures we depend on, we're part of it and it, our existence depends upon it. So biology surely has at the very least, besides telling us how our body works and how we can be healthier, uh, that's very important. But in addition, um, what biology teaches us is that we're very special in the sense of the environment in which we can hope to survive and, and flourish. And that's the environment we should be taking care of. And it isn't just physical environment. It isn't just stopping the climate change of running out of natural resources. All those are important. But it's also in maintaining that biosphere. Well, you've found yourself in a number of controversies over the years when you've taken what you learn about the natural world and you apply that to human behavior. There's a debate going on now among evolutionary biologists about altruism. That's right. Tell me, tell me something about that. Well, it's, it's quite technical and uh, it's caused a, um, a very strong uh, controversy, which we expected two mathematicians and I, uh, brought to culmination a uh, series of papers I've published over the last six years or so, questioning the ruling theory of the origin of altruism as being essentially that which evolves when you're helping out relatives, not just offspring, surely that's a mm -hmm. given, but more than that, collateral offspring. When you're in a situation, the old theory said, that you are uh, helping out Ken and they're helping you out, uh, then there's a mechanism that comes into play that makes altruism a lot easier to evolve and in fact uh, helps to explain how complicated societies evolve. Now that sounds like a reasonable idea, which is why I promoted it so heavily <laughs> in my early books in mm -hmm. the 1970s in sociobiology that altruism actually arises and therefore complex social behavior with it uh, in, um, uh, with uh, the appearance of collateral help, kin selection, that is evolution based upon help among collateral relatives, not just offspring and, and parents. But uh, what we have contended, and not carelessly so, after a long look at the, exam at the evidence, and by the first mathematical analysis ever accomplished to take the assumptions of kin selection theory, the prevailing mm -hmm. theory, prevail for four, uh, 40 years, and going for the first time uh, by uh, exact analysis of its assumptions down to the foundations, a very difficult mathematical problem which took a couple of my mathematical colleagues of, uh, of the first rank, mm -hmm. it turns out that it's just wrong. And so we have to replace it with something that I think is a lot more uh, straightforward, and that is called multi-level selection. Not denied by those who put the emphasis on kin selection, but they simply had just pushed it aside and not paid attention. And this is the uh, existence simultaneously of what we call individual level selection. Individuals competing with other individuals in different lines within a group, within a society as it forms. At one level, that's individual level selection. And then at the next level, it's group versus group. That's what uh, has been rejected for the most part, that that could happen, but we show that it can and rather readily. Mm -hmm. And so it turns to, it comes to pass that the two are competing with each other. Individual level selection, going the other way, going the other way, group selection. And the group selection is a powerful force in the evolution of the human species, as evidenced by something that kin selection never could explain. Things like constant group competition. The in Intense instinct people have to form groups, not necessarily family groups or groups of relatives, 
but all sorts of other groups, and to gather in allies and to have conflict, contest, leading all the way from football games for play all the way up to war. Mm -hmm. It's a human trait and has been since prehistory. So that and a lot of other things are beginning to become clearer, I believe, with the new approach using multi-level selection theory as the process, the, the dynamical force of evolution. So if you had one, one last thing you could say to, to the students who are graduating or the ones who are thinking of coming to, to Carolina or another one of America's great research universities who are, who are watching this. Uh, I don't hesitate to say the University of North Carolina is one of America's great uh, research universities, uh, the oldest, and certainly premier among uh, public uh, research universities. I cannot imagine a better university to go to for this purpose or to graduate from. And so I have to speak in a somewhat partisan manner uh, by saying I'm just delighted it's a southern university since I'm from the south. But more than that, I'm so pleased that uh, the University of North Carolina, uh, it's not alone in this, but certainly doing very well, is including science uh, in its basic training to prepare people, not just for careers in science, but also everyone, for the techno-scientific century that we're in, and uh, in the subjects and in the ideas and the background of knowledge that are going to prevail in American culture from now on. Ed, we're so honored that you came yeah. to uh, participate in commencement and to be here in Chapel Hill. Thanks, thanks again for coming. Thank you very much.